Is that all you're gonna do today? You're just gonna play with your stuff? Just play with your stuff? Well, at least you're getting something done today. Hey guys, welcome to the studio, and as you can see, once again, it's snowing outside. <laughs> I was gonna go down to the Milwaukee Zoo and get a little b-roll shot, but there is 11 and a half inches of snow in Port Washington and 9 inches in Sockville, which I have to drive through both to get to Milwaukee. And we're expected in Sheboygan to get 15 today, so it's locked down in the studio. I was originally planning, and I probably still will because I'm going to be stuck in the studio all day, to uh, do a watercolor portrait. I have a couple of ideas, so I brought brand new cans and paper. And then I got to being sidetracked, and then I started looking at ink-tense pencils and watercolor pencils, and then I went, wait a minute, you know what I haven't done? I haven't done a video for you guys on the different media that I work in, because I work in a lot of media. We've talked about this before, about when I went to the SVA, and they said, uh, what, what, what media do you work in? Wait, what? No, you, no, no, no. Artists don't work in more than one media. They, they... They don't work in more than one media. That's not a thing that happens. So I work in a bunch of different medias and I never went over the different properties and the different qualities and the tools that you would go uh, and use with them. And I never really went over the different kinds of surfaces and canvases that you would use with that. And I think I'm going to do that video today because it's snowing outside. Mm -mm. <laughs> we are not driving in this. Okay, so let's talk about the first media, and that usually is whether or not you work in acrylic or oil. Now, I don't work with oil because I have a lot of acrylic paints, and I have a lot of other stuff in this studio, so for me to pick up yet another media is really <laughs> not very... I don't need to pick up another media. We do. We, I pretty much got it all covered except for oil. Um, so and I did recently watch a video on YouTube uh, as of last month, and it went over the difference between like the Liquitex Basics and like the Liquitex High Viscosity. And I usually choose the Liquitex Basics because it's more economical. Got a wispy hair hanging out there. Okay. So I usually choose the Liquitex Basics over the high viscosity because you can generally save two to three to maybe as much as ten and fifteen dollars a tube. And this is double check that. This is a four ounce tube and this is a two ounce tube. So this four ounce tube can generally run you under five dollars for a basic, and this two ounce tube can any be anywhere from four to fifteen twenty dollars I've actually seen some of the blues uh, actually be as much as twenty two dollars so um, generally I've been going with the basics but this video went over how um, these high viscosity uh, which are really good for peaking they actually have better pigment in them so I might actually pick up some of the soft bodied acrylics because uh, I really don't need something that acts like an oil paint. I'm really not very fond of having to deal with peaks and valleys and shadows when somebody's looking at my art. I just can't get into the three-dimensional aspect while I'm painting. It's bad enough to deal with that when I'm painting. I can't add on top of that. So one of the properties of the uh, acrylic paint is that it's water-soluble. So you don't need turpentine and thinners, and you typically don't need sealers with it. And I'm going to apologize because the kitten's running around here playing. So you're going to see her collar and hear her collar all the time. Um, but typically you won't need, like, 
a sealer, you won't need turpentine to thin out your paints with, and they do make water-soluble oils, which to me in my head says it's acrylic paint, we're just going to retitle it. But, I, I can't, I, should, I could take the collar off, but that's about all I can do. Um, so basically to me, water-soluble oils are basically just acrylic with a different title. I haven't really looked into the difference, but effectively I do have a large variety of acrylic paints and they hang off my door well not really my door but they hang on this rack here you know this rack I bought at Michael's and it's like quite a few slots for acrylic paint uh, it hangs right here on a curtain rod and um, maybe these tubes can run you you know anywhere from 450 to like twenty dollars as I said so depends on your source and whether or not you're buying um, the high viscosity liquitex or if you're buying the basics and that's going to determine your pigment now the reason I haven't gone with the soft body is because the soft body actually comes in jars not tubes the tubes make it really convenient to store it hang it and I got enough stuff around here so I don't necessarily know if I'm gonna go with the soft body or the acrylic paints can get used on several different surfaces let me say that correctly. They can get used on several different surfaces. They can get used on this heavier duty acrylic paper. Okay. And a lot of the papers that you can use for acrylic painting are actually denoted for being used in acrylic painting. They generally say right down here whether or not they're going to be heavy enough, whether they're going to buckle, whether it's just going to be like, nope, can't do this today. Um, and generally you're looking for at least a 200 pound paper, which is going to denote the thickness of the paper and whether or not it's going to buckle and be able to take care of it for you. Um, now this acrylic paper, I don't know if the camera is going to get this. Okay, we'll see if I can't get it. But what it's got is it's got a tooth on it that mirrors effectively like the thread count on like a linen canvas. So you've got that very 90 degree kind of grate on that and it's meant to really replicate the texture of a canvas. Now can I go on the other side and maybe use the off side for a smooth kind of like a vellum or a smooth pressed paper? Yes I can. Uh, I don't see why you couldn't. And uh, so this is of course also acid free. This is a 9 by 12 sheet and I'm sure if you go on Blick Art Materials or if you go to your local Michaels or Blick Art Materials if you have a local outlet down by you guys you should be able to pick up different sizes but you can get acrylic paper. Another thing you guys can do is you can get what is popularly known as the stretched canvas. Now I don't spend a whole lot of money on my stretch canvases because, let's face it, I go through a lot of them. So um, I'm not necessarily committed to a particular brand of canvas. I know some sort of artists are. Uh, Lisa Lackery is really, really committed to her Frederick's canvases. Um, but. I'm not necessarily one that has a lot of money and can wait on shipping and I actually don't think I can buy Frederick canvases because I've looked in pretty much all the places I could buy them and the only place I could buy them would be Dick Blick. And um, I don't have that kind of time. So, uh, and your canvases can run anywhere from really, really huge to super tippy tiny. So, um, and most of them are primed. Now you can go to the store and buy raw canvases and effectively these rebars so that uh, you can stretch a custom canvas. If you go to Hobby Lobby, they have oval and round cut canvases and custom canvases. I've been seeing canvases that are three dimensional and come out at like a 90 degree angle from the wall so that you have different views of the artwork as you're looking at it. I mean the options for canvases have really really exploded in the last couple of years and some of them are really 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 cool and it's even so much as like I've seen canvases that are like this and then they have like almost like a spacer bar and a frame so you can paint the frame and it's a stretch canvas as well and then it's sunk behind or sunk over uh, uh, effectively another frame so you can make it look like uh, your painting is coming out onto the frame and then I think you would frame that on top of it so you would need a really deep frame for that because that's your standard thickness 
and it would double that. So you would probably need almost like a, a one inch deep frame because that's that's most canvases are about half inch in depth. But yeah, go to your local Michaels, go to Hobby Lobby, go on some of these art supply stores. You can find a lot of options when it comes to stretched canvases. All right, so another medium that you can use for acrylic paint is canvas board. And this is basically like a pressed hardboard uh, that it's not real. I mean, it's going to have some flux, but not a lot. Pretty good for for shipping and uh, is not as prone to maybe distortion as a stretched canvas. The problem with that when you're using it, however, is that it also doesn't have the bounce that a canvas has. So this is much more like piece, you know, painting on a piece of maybe hardboard that's got some texture. Don't know if the camera's going to catch that texture. Uh, but it is textured in that 90 degree kind of grate that you would see with a woven canvas. Um, generally they come in sizes anywhere from a 2x2 two two to I think the largest I have seen is a 38 by 42 uh, and that's uh, in inches. Uh, these seem pretty friendly as far as shipping. Uh, most of them come pre-primed. Wouldn't hurt if you took some gesso and reprimed these. I have also had kind of uh, an issue with them, with canvas boards particularly being really toothy with the actual canvas that's stretched across them. And so it's not unlike uh, me to get some tools out and take a rotor sander and sand the tooth down and reprime it. Just not a really big fan <laughs> of a lot of tooth in my canvas. But that all depends on your style. Uh, those who want a lot of tooth are going to be fine with it. I don't necessarily like a lot of tooth in my canvas. That's why I have a tendency of sanding them down. Okay, so in this cabinet, perhaps you've seen it as we've panned across the studio a few times is some primers in liquid medium for some of uh, my paints and for some other mediums. We'll get there in a minute. Um, but the first thing I want to point out to you since we just got done talking about acrylic paint and we got done talking about the canvases and the canvas papers is I want to talk to you about gesso. Okay, so you can buy canvases and typically canvases are pre-gesso, they're pre-primed, which means that you can directly paint right on them, they're ready to go. Um, but I've had a lot of artists complain that you don't necessarily get quality canvases and quality gesso. And if you don't like a lot of tooth to your canvas board, it can be real typical that you're going to want to sand it down. After you do that, you have to reprime it. Now you can go to a lot of places and just buy gesso. And you can also go to uh, like Michaels and some art supply stores and you can get black gesso. So for those of you who are real hyped up about that galaxy painting, that wasn't actually a canvas I primed. That was actually a pre-primed black canvas primed with black gesso. Okay, and then what I did as a reminder if you haven't seen that video, although most of you have, is that I went over the black canvas with a subprime of ultramarine blue so that when I went over it with uh, the zinc white, which is a transparent white, uh, that it, the blue would kind of show through since that's in that lower spectrum of color. So that is gesso. Gesso is important. You're going to need some gesso. All right, so now we're going to get into... Let's not kid ourselves. Different qualities of paint. Because I did talk about the painting paint that I use, but you can also go and get craft paint, which I have craft paint. I have uses for craft paint. However, I don't use craft paint on paintings, okay? It behaves differently, it does have a tendency of flaking off, it doesn't bind to gesso really well, and 
the color is a little faded and I'm looking for a little bit more color retention than that. Also, craft paint is not necessarily known for being UV resistant, which means it may fade and discolor over time. So, I know it's a cheaper option, but you might want to avoid craft paint when you're talking about doing fine art painting. That, however, does not mean... Ah! Alright, that, however, does not mean that you cannot go to the craft aisle and get some supplemental things to help you with your art. All right, so we're talking about extenders. Oh yeah, extenders. Extenders are great. And while acrylic paint is water soluble, extenders are one step above just doing water with your paint. Keep in mind, once you get more than 50% on your watercolor paint, you're, you're thinning down the binder that actually holds the pigment together and while it looks really great as a wash, it can flake off your painting. So what you want to do is stick to an extender in order to thin down your medium to maybe like a watercolor transparency and they make different consistencies. Like this extender is really really thin, it's a little bit thicker than water, um, but typically if I want kind of more of a wash and I want the lower colors to show through or I want to do something where I have kind of that that feeling like the zinc white has where it's got a transparent feel and there is a little bit amount of colors that have that quality a lot of them have a chalky kind of base um, you want to be able to thin it down and use it as kind of a a wash the word escaped me I'm sorry okay then you have other things and this is like a blending gel. Blending gel literally kind of has the consistency of hair gel and if you have ever watched a down to do very video you're gonna find she uses blending gels as a thicker medium to blend her colors. It literally has its properties in its name. It's gel, it's thin, it actually will float your pigment and that's another one that I had. I don't think I have it anymore because I honestly don't use it. Um, and it's called floating medium and it works effectively the same way blending gel does. It floats the color and the pigment within the media. Um, substrate? I, I really have an obsession with the word substrate today. Um, but effectively what it does is it gives you something thicker and you can peak and valley and you can get that really cute uh, clear color. Alright. So, oh, I take that back. I do have floating medium. <laughs> I'm sorry, I had a stupid moment. Okay, so we do have floating medium, and this I got from my mom. I really don't use it. Considering it's bigger than all the bo other bottles, it's really ridiculous that I completely missed it. Anyway, so we do have floating medium. It's got pretty much the same consistency as the blending gel. Pretty much does the same thing, just effectively different title. Okay, uh, so effectively it creates a gel uh, textured binder <coughs> that you can mix your paints up in and does the same thing as your extender. Okay, so those are your three additives that you might want to go to the store and pick up. I love my extender. Alright, so this is another item that you may or may not want to include in the stuff that you buy at the store. And I will use this. You use it more typically with watercolor. However, I have used it with acrylic painting. And that is... This is really not a good one to use because... Okay. It's uh, masking fluid. This is just really not good lighting for this. Let me see if I can get this a little bit better. So, masking fluid. Um, this one's Winsor Newton. This one is also Winsor Newton, but unfortunately it has a it has a price sticker over it. Um, and what this is, is basically it's liquid latex. That's all it is. Ideally, this stuff should not have a color. It should not color tinge your paint or your surface that you're working on and what it does is it seals watertight the surface that you're working on. So if you have a base laid out and you kind of want to do something like a 
just kind of layer on color, but you want to retain your color. You can use masking fluid on your first layer to retain your whites. Second layer, you can use it to retain whatever your foundation layer is and then continue to build it up. Okay. Masking fluid, as you can see, can be rather expensive. Okay. So like these two, I bought quite a few years ago and I don't necessarily know that it has a shelf life. I can say one very, very important thing about it. Because it's basically liquid latex, so think of a balloon, okay? Think of rubber cement, okay? Because those all share the same properties, okay? Something that you need to know about using a liquid mask or masking fluid or anything else. Do not, do not use a good paint with this masking fluid, okay? Because you're basically painting with a very thin version of liquid cement, what it will do is it will build up in the bristles and it will get into the ferrule and it will destroy your brushes. So if you need to paint it with a brush, if you need to apply it with a brush, then what you need to do is literally go to the store, go to Walmart and get some cheap craft brushes and then trim those puppies down. Do not use your $60 brushes with masking fluid, it will destroy your masking fluid, or the masking fluid will destroy your brushes. Okay. The other thing I've noticed over the year, and that's not something that they advertise because I think they just want you to keep buying this stuff, is that um, if you don't use it, it will start to cake up and solidify, which means that you may have bought ten dollars worth of masking fluid for a project used maybe, maybe a tenth of the bottle, maybe half the bottle, and now you've got this other bottle here and it's, you go to use it like six months later, it could be a month later, it, I'm not gonna lie, it could be a month later, and what you have in here is basically a rubber ball. And now you're like all ticked off, okay? I get that, I so get that, I was so angry, I bought this and I was like, why can't I use it? There's no shelf life on this. Okay, so what you want to do is you need to buy, it's rubbing alcohol, rubbing alcohol. Let me see. Yeah, rubbing alcohol. <laughs> I forgot. Okay, so what you need to do when you buy liquid mask is you need to buy a bottle of standard rubbing alcohol from the H&B department. You know what the great thing is about being a manager and acting as a general manager? <laughs> Sometimes you get interrupted, so I'm trying to get back on track. So we were talking about the masking fluid otherwise known as liquid mask and the fact that it can sometimes dry out so what you want to do is get some rubbing alcohol and then usually there's just that little bit just like you have in a soda or any other thing where there's a little bit of an air gap for the neck of the bottle um, put about maybe that much just a little bit in that cap and then just take it and shake it okay the rubbing alcohol will help break down the latex back into a liquid form, okay? You really need to shake this stuff, though, because what you need to do is get the ball of, of latex to break down, okay? If you just have liquid um, rubbing alcohol right here, that's all you're going to be putting on your paper, and then you're going to have a problem because it's not actually going to be masking fluid. But this stuff really doesn't have a shelf life once you open it and I'm not even sure if once um if once the uh once you know if it sits on the shelf too long if it uh actually is any good I store both of my masking fluids upside down like this so that I have liquid um rubbing alcohol on the bottom and then when I tip it back upside down that the ball that sometimes forms falls back down into the bottle and then I'll have a gap so that I'll have rubbing alcohol on the bottom and the top to help break down the rubber. So that is the masking fluid which yeah they don't tell you that at all. So if you are on a budget, which I am, um, 
hand in hand, rubbing alcohol goes with masking fluid or liquid mask. This is a good case in point. I actually turns out that I had three things of liquid masking fluid. I have never opened this. And as you can see, it is solid. I've never used this. Okay. And she is not moving. Um, and if you need to thin it out, just a little, um, a little Rubbing alcohol will thin this down, but once this dries, this is going to be, li it's literally going to feel and behave like a rubber balloon, okay? It will not totally bind your paper. Something as simple as an eraser can get this stuff off once it dries. It will peel clean from your paper and bakes, makes a watertight seal. I, I want this off my finger now. Um, but it does cure rather fast so um, like this is literally the stuff I just pulled out on my finger right here and it's it's really it's very stretchy Let's see if I can get that on camera see it's it's really elastic um, you can speed cure it with a hairdryer and um, you want to make sure it's totally cured before you try to apply your liquid medium whether it's watercolor uh, the ink tense pencils or acrylic paint. So that's the whole thing with liquid mask. Okay? Uh, make sure it's dry, to basically rub it off, and it'll all come off in one big gooey thing. Um, it won't be sticky, but it will stick to itself. So if for some reason you have a large area that you need to mask, and you can use liquid mask on canvases, um, but if you have a large area that you need to mask, you may want to mask it in layers, and then make sure that when you do it that um, you are letting it completely dry before you put on another layer. Like in some paintings, I've had a large layer that I've had to mask off. All right, so we've gone over paint, we've gone over surfaces, we've gone over extender, we have gone over masking fluid. Now we're going to get into brushes. If you've ever been into a art store. Hell, if you've been to Walmart, you will know that there are enough brushes out there with enough different bristle types and enough styles to really, 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 really super confuse you. And this can get confusing. And honestly, this will break it down real easy. The best way I can say to figure out what kind of brush you will need is to know what that is designed for. So like a mop brush, which is what this is, is basically used for washes. Now this is made out of a natural hair. Natural hair versus synthetic hairs. Natural hairs will break. Okay, so you will find these little itty bitty hairs. Do you see that? Camera's picking it up. These itty bitty little hairs you will find all over your canvas and all over your paper and it will be in your paper and it will screw up the flow of your pigments okay whether or not it's ink tense if it's watercolor if it's acrylic if it's oils these natural fiber oil natural fiber brushes that break will screw up the flow of your paper so i literally will go through and you've probably seen me do it where i will go in with a razor knife or a tweezers or something and pick that out and then go back over it and smooth it out okay so natural fiber brushes really good for absorbing stuff especially mops natural fiber brushes break okay expect, expect the bristles to break nylon and synthetic brushes and the like don't break have a longer life expectancy not necessarily preferable to some people but it's all in what you really 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 want to do with them okay and different brushes which we are not going to get into on this episode uh, have different uses like this is a smaller version of a mop uh, this is a half inch mop versus this one which is a two inch mop okay so they all have different uses and different purposes so play with your different brush materials and play with 
effectively what they're going to be used for. Uh, when you're using your brushes, this is another good set of tips. One, do not leave your brushes in your water well like that, okay? This will cause your bristles to bend, weaken, it will cause them to expand in the ferrule. And in case you don't know what the ferrule is, the ferrule is this part of your brush that actually crimps down on the brushes themselves past the handle, okay? So you don't want to do that with your water uh, and your brushes. Don't leave them sit in there. When you're done washing them, rest them horizontally, okay? Like so, okay? When they're dry, I store mine bristle side up, okay? Do you want to dry them bristle side up? No. And the reason is the same reason why you don't stick them resting down in the water. The water will work its way up the ferrule and push your brushes out. Um, it will distort them and they won't work right. Also, the, the pigment can work up the ferrule and then cause the whole brush to go to hell in a hand basket too. So this is my recommendation. This is one of my favorite water wells that I've ever found and I've been to a lot of art craft stores. Um, this has effectively crates in the bottom and then two separate wells. So what I do when I need to get pigment off my brushes is I will typically have a towel and I will wipe the vast amount of the pigment. If it's not a mixed color, I will wipe the remainder of the pigment in the paint well, the bulk of it that's in the bristles off on the towel itself, and then I will be in here like Bob Ross, kind of just kind of going like this and kind of working it out of the ferrule and out of the base of the brushes and out of the body of the brush. Then I will go into here and then I will get some actual clear, clean water and get the rest of the remaining pigment out of there. And then, of course, then it will get set on the table and it will dry. Okay. When it's done drying, it will then get rested like this in this caddy over here, which you all saw before. So um, not too big of a deal. Um, some people will have these roll out things that, that looks like a, uh, hang on a second. I don't use them because I don't travel that much, but it looks an awful lot like this. This is actually for, for pencils, but they'll have ones for brushes like that too for traveling cases. Um, I don't travel and paint. I don't do a whole lot of plain air painting, but they do have them like that. My only concern is that there is not any protection around your brush. And that in that case, when you're using those a lot, and that's your primary way of sorting in uh, preserving your brushes, you may want to get one of these. Usually your brushes are sold with this, and it's this little plastic cap. They come off, and it's a nice way of preserving the shape of your brush, especially if you're going to put it in a roll-up tube like that. Um... See, and they're very hard to get on and off. God bless America. Um, nice way of preserving your brushes um, and the and the stuff. Like so, but they're a pain in the butt to get on, as you can see. Um, one other thing that I wanted to bring up, and that is brush cleaner and brush fiber shaper, okay? I have bought both of these. Um, because I work in acrylic, soap and water works really good for me. I have bought brush cleaner in the past. It doesn't work any better or any worse than soap and water. And as far as the brush shaper and brush, uh, the stuff that's supposed to be the care-all, for your brushes. If you have natural hair brushes, like this hog, like this uh, mop, if you have natural hair brushes like this mop, they can dry out. Guess what? You don't need to have brush cleaner to get that. Your hair conditioner that you have in your bathroom will restore some of the flexibility in this brush and keep your bristles from breaking. Now condition it, let it sit for about a half hour and absorb the oils from the conditioner, then wash it out and get all the conditioner out of that, and then go back to storing it, and that'll help kind of give you a little bit of extra life in your natural hair brushes. Um, 
if you have hognose brushes, which is what these are, they're a really, really stiff fiber, okay? So these I use a lot if you want a lot of texture in your brush stroke, which you can do with acrylic. So with the hognose brushes, because they are supposed to be thicker hair, you don't want to necessarily condition it unless you're getting a lot of breakage. And you do want to be very careful and keep an eye on where the bristles go into the ferrule, because this right here can actually cause you to have a lot of hairs that fall out. Uh, this is specifically for something with a lot of texture. I actually use my uh, hog hair brushes for effectively flicking on very tiny things, like if I'm doing stars in a galaxy. Uh, if you don't like doing this, because this is basically a flat, you can also use a toothbrush for that. Okay, again, very stiff. I was using this when I did Cody's paw prints to clean the paw prints up. So let's be like the weather's like. It's magical. It's not. It's dirt. I just haven't cleaned it. <clears throat> Uh, one thing I don't use a lot because I don't do a lot of textured painting, but uh, if you've ever seen a Bob Ross video, everybody has seen Bob Ross. Uh, he used a lot of palette knives in his work, and I don't because I don't use that much um, paint on my canvases, and I don't paint on anything harder or heavier than a canvas board, so I don't put a lot of paint that I would need a palette knife for. Uh, if I were to start going into the soft body pigments from Liquitex that are not in a tube, I would need a palette knife to scoop those out and put it in my palette. Okay? Okay, in the interim... Somebody went to the vet for their first vet visit, so she ought to be nice and quiet for the rest of the video. She all cashed. By the way, she also has a name this is officially Brooklyn! Her name is officially Brooklyn Mochi. And she is all kinds of cashed out today. <clears throat> okay, so there's one more thing related to acrylic paints that I want to point out for you guys. And that is the use of sponges and perhaps rollers. Now, with rollers, that's really good for applying an even coat of gesso rather than using a brush where you can get brush strokes. Um, <clears throat> however, you can still use rollers if you have a lot of area where you want to cover, maybe like a wall mural or something. Um, in this case, I got this cute little like one inch roller, two inch roller, two inch roller, um, because I need to paint that cabinet, okay? Um, now, if you saw previous videos, you would have noticed that this cabinet, which is my supply cabinet, had a really nice stone finish, but those stones were all tiles, and the tiles were falling off, and it was getting really annoying, so I replaced it with two wooden doors, and I'm going to do a faux finish on that. If you guys want to see the faux finish, I'm going to do that, and how I'm doing the faux finish on it, because it's going to look pretty close to the way, if not better than the way that the old one looked without the tiles falling off. Let me know in the comments below if you want me to do a video on faux finishing it. Otherwise, I am just gonna paint that and get it out of the way. So, sponges, rollers, actually sponges and rollers, stop being backwards. Um, and then the other thing you can do if you feel so inclined is if you're doing like a marble finish, which you can do with acrylic paints, you can do that with a feather, with a effectively wing feather you can buy from a craft store. If you guys want me to do faux finishes, which would be an awful lot like, wait for it. <clears throat> Stuff with like this Lion King painting where we did this this sandstone finish here, this limestone finish, um, then I will do more tutorials with like stone finishes and faux finishes so that you guys have something that you guys can use for backgrounds. The base of where the brushes go in to, uh, I just had a blank. So with natural hair brushes, especially hog nose brushes, uh, you have to be aware of where the base of the brush 
goes into, I just blanked it again. Mother trucker. 